like yeah. seeing Nomi on stage in her glittery pork t-shirt like <laughs> oh that's what a Jewish person can do that's mm-hmm. what an anti-Zionist queer disabled Jewish person can do we can mm-hmm. rock the stage we're the world to come Hi, I'm Rebecca. I'm Nomi. And this is Dreaming the World to to Come. come. This is Dreaming the World to Come, a project where we reimagine time and the ways we relate to it, aligning with ancestral Jewish traditions and honoring the diverse voices and experiences of the diaspora, past, present, and future and the magnificent humans who have been dreaming of a just world for millennia. Rebecca and I are both queer, non-binary, white, disabled Jews and Hebrew priestesses or priestesses, and we live in the Pacific Northwest on Squaxin land, also known as the Stachos Village and known colonially as Olympia, Washington. In addition to this podcast, we create a planner that combines Hebrew, Gregorian, and moon calendars. This year's is called Indwelling Dreams of Olam Haba. The podcast usually comes out the beginning of each Hebrew month and includes our takes on that month and an interview with a contributor who wrote about that month in the planner. You don't need the planner to enjoy the podcast, but you can buy it at dreamingtheworldtocome.com and it's actually on sale for five dollars right now while supplies last we are in the final waning months of 5783 so there are just a couple more months but the writings will continue to be relevant for years to come so it's still a good resource it's a collector's item Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) and we had made the announcement that we weren't doing the planner again But we actually decided to do it a a modified version of the planner this year. It won't have all the different contributors. We had limited financing for it, but we found a solution and we're working to something together and excited to make that offering again this year in in a, a little bit of a different form. It's been so helpful to me to have a clear place to go and look at when the holidays are, when the moon cycles are, what the Torah portions for each week are. It's just, I use it constantly. And we just kept being like, what are we going to do without this? So we are like, <laughs> let's just try to do a simpler version. And then the teachings of the past three years are still relevant every year. And this podcast will exist. This is our second to last episode of the podcast, but you can go back and listen to it starting again in Tishrei and catch up on each month as we go through 5784 as well. So we have made it to the month of Av. Rebecca, what are your main associations with the month of Av? I love the symbology and mystery of the month of Av. It's, I think, one of my favorite Jewish holiday pairings, Mm. for lack of a better way to describe it. Yeah, the, there's. I learned a teaching many years ago from Rabbi Kohenet Jillhammer that's from Lamentations, mm-hmm. that when we were in the desert for 40 years, Moses instructed people on the eve of the ninth of Av to dig a grave for themselves. And everyone mm-hmm. dug a hole in the ground. And then in the morning... We saw who was alive and who died. And that was when when people died during the year that night. And on Tisha B'Av? On Tisha B'Av. Yeah. Even before the destruction of the temple? Yeah, this is this is the teaching from Lamentations. Interesting. Interesting. Um, and then on the fortieth year, uh, no one died. They they mm-hmm. dug the graves, and uh, in the morning, no one died. So they dug the graves again, 
the mm. next night and the next night and the next night and still no one died no one died and mm. then they got to the 15th of Av the full moon and they started celebrating and that's mm. Tuba Av now so Tisha B'Av and Tuba Av are kind of based in this really ancient thing that happened that I've always mm. been very fascinated by that teaching. And I'm mm. kind of like, bring it back. <laughs> mm. the, the, this practice of digging a hole in the earth to spend the night in, you know, so that connection with the earth, the fear of animals coming to get you or and the mythology around like you don't know if you'll live or you'll die that sounds terrifying i know (laughs) (laughs) do you want to do you want to sleep in a hole i have felt really moved actually eden and i learned about it together and we um eden perlstein and um we were talking about how we wanted to do it because i i I do feel drawn to do it still. All the, I mean, that was like I learned about it maybe 17, 18 years ago or something. Yeah, I do mm-hmm. feel, I always think of it every year. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, it sounds like it would smell really good. Yeah. To be like down in the earth. I don't know how I'd use my CPAP. I probably wouldn't get a single <laughs> bit of sleep. <laughs> I know, depending on where it was and if anybody else was around, like, or not. Yeah. (laughs) Wow. Can you imagine laying down in a hole and then, like, at some point you get just, like, ripped apart by wild animals and you're like, okay, I died. (laughs) Yeah. Or just people just dying and then that's their grave and they cover them up. Like, yeah. Wild. Wow. Yeah. So that's kind of the way back mythology from mm. from this month and this time of year. And now, mm. now we celebrate or we observe Tisha B'Av, mm-hmm. the ninth of Av, as the memorial remembrance of the destruction of the temple, first by the Babylonians and then hundreds of years later by the Romans after it got rebuilt again. Mm-hmm. And it's become really this holiday for uh, as like a collective grieving. Yeah. And for inconsolable grief, which has been very transformative for me, actually, like, I don't know how many times in my life I've had opportunity to just like, feel all of the grief of my experience slash the human experience and like cry about it as hard as I needed to. And like, honestly, I've spent, I spent years crying a lot, (laughs) like that being like a major, major part of my life. But I remember being at a Kohenet retreat and we do this ritual there of like having these stones and like taking stones from the altar and then kind of like rebuilding something on the altar with these stones. But I remember doing the lamentations and I was one of the people who got to vocalize it. And like, as a vocalist, like having grief move through my body with my voice in that way and really expressing grief with my voice is very powerful. And then it just like broke open and I just remember sobbing and Mm. being like, I have permission. Like this is what we do on this day. And something about that was so healing for me. And I remember even like Jill came over to me and like put her hand on me and was like breathing with me. And even that I was like, don't you try to make me calm down. You know, I was like, <laughs> I was like let me be inconsolable. Please just let me be inconsolable. Mm-hmm. And I don't know. And then at some point, you know, you move out of that. I wasn't trying to stay stuck there. I was just really trying to feel it all the way. And I think there's something really powerful about having that day where you don't have to put a positive spin on it. You don't have to use it to be like, and we persevere. It's like, sometimes it just really is as fucking bad as it can possibly be. And what does that feel like? It's, yeah, I don't, can't think of other spaces that really allow for that. So. Uh, Yeah. I love that it's built into our, our processing of the year. Yeah. That there's space for that. Yeah. I've been in a lot of grieving um, 
rituals in groups of people. And Mm. I really feel like being with other people, grieving allows something to, not for everyone, but it can really allow you to let go and feel the depth of the grief. And through those rituals, I learned how to grieve more deeply on my own. Yeah. Yeah. And it makes me think, oh, well, I was just going to say that um, the the other, something else that's really helped me grieve in life is music. Um, mm-hmm. And so the prayers and the, the, mm-hmm. s- the lamentations, you know, and the moving your body that's encouraged during that time mm-hmm. also helps, helps yeah. with the grief. Yeah. It makes me think of the Mekunenet, the mourning woman, Mm -hmm. and the tradition that is not just in Jewish culture and others as well, where there's an actual occupation for women to grieve at people's funerals and that you like hire somebody who's going to like wail and cry and the presence of that person who's able to express in that way helps everybody express and feel more and grieve more together. Yeah. I'm just feeling really feeling what you're saying about collective grief being a way into experiencing your own grief more. Yeah. Yeah. And there's this transition in Tisha B'Av that happens. Oh, and just for people listening, the Mekonene is one of the archetypes that shows up in, in the Torah. Um, and during Tisha B'Av, there's a transition in the day from this deep mm-hmm. grieving into, into what's next. And mm-hmm. yeah. So some of the, some of the traditions or practices associated with Tisha B'Av are fasting, not wearing a tali or tefillin, and draping the Torah in black. For me, I always like strip my altar completely bare, sit on the floor by candlelight, chant the Lamentations, which is the Echa, which is this like really intense, tripped out prophecy actually that was written it's documenting just devastation and war but it makes it sound like it's remembering it but it was actually written as a prophecy like foretold and then you were going to speak to this transition that happens yeah because there's a teaching that the messiah will be born on Tisha B'Av. So in the afternoon, there's kind of like this transition to welcome the Messiah. And in some communities, people put on perfume. Um, for those of us who are sense sensitive, we're like, no, no. <laughs> maybe cottonwood bud oil, <laughs> Fla- fl- bring some flowers or something. Yeah. Um, uh, but I think that feeling the depth of grief for me when I've gone into those spaces it's really Mm -hmm. opened something within me and necessary to feel the depth of joy Mm -hmm. that life has to offer so having their that mythology with the messiah will come that day it really resonates with me this last year um I rewrote the lamentations inspired by Lynn Gottlieb Rabbi Lynn's um Alchet that she wrote, which is an accounting for sins against Palestinians. And so I took um, inspiration from that and some of the material from that and rewrote it with the style of the Lamentations, which is very kind of like narrative and poetic and super distressing. Like just the way it's written is heartbreaking. Like it's kind of impossible to read, especially read out loud without being really impacted. And I hosted a little gathering that was co-facilitated with a student of ours, Sherry Paris, where we recited part of the original Lamentations, the Echa, and then we recited the Lamentations for the occupation of Palestine. Mm. And that was really powerful. And I think there's something too about, I mean, I know for myself, it can be hard to let in how horrific it is what's happening to people and i think sometimes like you have to let yourself feel it to feel motivated to act or really know like what's at stake and so i want that to continue to be part of my mm-hmm. practice for tishabab as well 
It's really beautiful. Yeah. There's another beautiful teaching for Tisha B'Av. This, this month is so juicy. There's so much, mm-hmm. so much for both of these holidays mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, that at the end of the day, you do Kiddush Levana. Mm-hmm. So that's the blessing of the moon when the moon is nearing fullness or full. Um, Sephardic and Ashkenazi communities have slightly different timing, but it's it's blessing the moon and there's a, a practice to physically jump towards the moon however whatever is accessible to you i remember doing that in my backyard with you yeah. and zev that one time that was so sweet yeah <laughs> so there is a transition that happens in the day and mm-hmm. our tradition isn't you know saying keep grieving forever there's right like feel it fully and then and then transition and then five days later transition mm-hmm. towards this holiday of love which mm-hmm. is tuba of and so it's like the grapes are coming into ripeness they're not fully ripe yet but they're getting there and there's a tradition for people to throw white clothes into a pile and then you pick up someone's who isn't yours and that was a tradition to like help there be less distinction around class and then people dancing in white and then other people watching them under the full moon (laughs) under the full moon under the ripening grapes Mm -hmm. and um, so sexy (laughs) and then yeah having sex like you know doing what you want the earth to do like Mm -hmm. like keep fertilizing Mm -hmm. and creating and there's a you know it was supposedly the day when people would like meet their beshert and Mm -hmm. there's kind of a thing of like the you know i like the way that you'll frame it as like the people who want to be chosen because like traditionally it's like maidens Mm -hmm. you know putting on white dresses and dancing in the in the vineyards under the full moon and then the people who are doing the choosing which was implied to be men but could be anyone watching and seeing like who they would want to choose and going and dancing with them and that many like lifelong pairings would come from that um and yeah the idea that it's like you're meant to be a person Mm -hmm. um which could be just like a one night stand or a life partner, but they're meant to be in some way, or maybe they're a variety mm-hmm. of people. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and I know in Israel it's celebrated kind of like Valentine's Day, but um, I really love the potential of this to be a queer love holiday, like mm-hmm. a Jewish queer love holiday. Mm-hmm. And last year we got together and like made flower crowns and mm-hmm. stuff. And, but I remember being like, Oh, I want there to be like a queer Jewish, like classifieds or something like it be a, a thing to like find your beshert for Tuba Av. And I don't know if I'll have the energy to create something, probably not. <laughs> have the energy to create something like that this year but well, maybe if somebody anyone else listening does, will <laughs> yes yes please more more opportunities for queers to find each other jewish queers to find each other um i was gonna suggest let's do a dance party this tuba Av, but i think you might have other plans on tuba Av. is that I'll true be out of town yeah okay okay yeah. well you can you should do one though <laughs> I might want to. <laughs> yeah, um, I know. I was like, I've been learning how to DJ. So, <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, we. I mean, we've been Vito and I have been talking a lot about wanting to have a queer outside dance party, and they've also been getting it more into DJing. So cool. We'll have to make it happen at some point. Yeah. Somehow. Yeah. Cool. Well, anything else about Av that we want to say before we do you want to talk part? about anything about the seven weeks of comfort? Oh, yeah. And there's this really cool thing that is kind of a mirror of the Omer, the seven weeks of the Omer that is called um, the seven weeks of comfort. I believe that it starts at Tisha B'Av till Rosh Hashanah. So the point is to have this seven week journey from out of those total depths, that exhaustion of loss and grief, and then moving 
gently towards this new life, new rebirth of mm -hmm. Rosh Hashanah. And I like to remember that that is gentle because Elul is, you know, a time of, of real accounting and reckoning and looking at the soul and, and being like, you know, we'll talk about that in the little podcast, but um, it's nice to remember, like, this is a time of consolation. This is a time of comfort. And so when we're doing this accounting of our souls, like letting that be as, as sweet and loving as possible. Yeah. 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 And that's so, a good preview of the a little conversation that we'll have. Wishing everyone depth and joy this month. And enjoy the interview with Jenna, who is such a wonderful, brilliant person. It was mm -hmm. so fun to talk to her. Mm -hmm. Such a joy. Jenna, welcome. Hello. Hi. Hello. This is so exciting. I feel like we've been orbiting each other for like decades, and this is our first just like actual face to face conversation. I'm so glad to be here with you. Thank you so much. Mm, thank you so much for your contribution and all the work that you do in the world. I'm so excited for our listeners to get to learn more about you. So I'm going to read your bio first to just give people a little bit of a sense of who you are. Jenna Shalomith, she, her, grew up sporadically homeless in a family that spoke six different languages with Jewish roots in Morocco and Russia. A writer at the intersection of Arabic, created to share sacred stories, and Riot Girl, created for punk rock feminist expression. She works with Mizna, an Arab Muslim arts journal. For pay, Jenna focuses on community engagement and systems change addressing complex challenges impacting communities on Dakota land slash Twin Cities, Minnesota. Singing with groups and smashing white supremacy patriarchy are her happy places and will include where you can follow her in our show notes. Hmm. What a great bio. Oh my gosh. And you, the piece you wrote is so fabulous. I wonder if there's something that you'd like to share about your process with it or the content from the month of Av. Thank you for that invitation. Um, well, I was raised in a, in a culturally very Jewish space. Mm -hmm. And with principles that were more about tikkun olam. Mm -hmm. And uh, I always knew which side of a picket line to stand on and never to oh. cross one. And that was being Jewish. Mm -hmm. And so when it came to this invitation to be part of this planner, I was like, I'm not the right kind of Jew. Mm -hmm. oh. And what a fantastic invitation. The two of you invited me too because I am just the right kind of Jew. Yes, and you are. Like, <laughs> and so writing this piece, that was the space I had to I had to walk into it. You were like, here's the banquet table, here's the archway, come on through, sister friend. And I think that writing the piece was doing the ritual of the piece. Like, okay, mm -hmm. where where is that limiting belief in me about being the right kind of Jewish person mm -hmm. and the pain of the breaking? So when my family moved from Morocco to New York City, the white Ashkenazim wouldn't let them live near them, wouldn't hire them, wouldn't pray with them. Mm -hmm. And so the minion that my family did, we did outside in a park. Mm -hmm. So... Where is home? What do you build out of that? How do you create your connection to yourself, to land, to people, to community, to home? My family left, like a lot of Jewish people, we left Morocco not because that wasn't home. There were many close, close connections between Jews and Muslims in Morocco. But with the state of Israel, there was a lot of pressure to build the nation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And my family said, we're not going to do that. Mm -hmm. Wow. And it was tricky because they came to the U.S., which is not, which is indigenous land. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So do we yeah. colonize there? Do we colonize mm -hmm. here? And 
how do we claim community, build community? So writing this was part of that healing of, I am the right kind of Jew. Where, where do those beliefs live in my body? Um, I get to grieve the disconnection, acknowledge it openly, disconnection from that land, from people, and have a nice reclaiming. It's like a, the inside of a snail shell, the circles, mm -hmm. right? And how do we return and turn and return? Mm -hmm. So in my first trip back to Morocco, I was traveling with this guy I had been seeing on and off. And this Arab man sitting with us said, oh, is this your first trip to Morocco? And my co-traveler is African-American, raised by Black Panthers in New York. So this stranger said to us, oh, this is your first time home. Well, Africa welcomes you home. Mm -hmm. We just cried. Yeah. And he was not confused, right? So what did what did we have to release in order to be in that reality of ourselves mm -hmm. and belonging? And being in Morocco, talking to person after person that says, I miss my Jewish neighbors. Yeah. We would, um, one story I heard, the two of you are going to love this, they would bring over fish for the second night of Passover. Mm -hmm. So they did mm -hmm. Passover. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Isn't that what Mimuna is about? Is like that connection between Jewish and Muslim neighbors. Yeah. Right. right. So that's what I think Av is about is mm -hmm. doing that mindful remembering. Mm -hmm. And often being in the reality of ourselves, the truth about ourselves, there's some grieving. There's like, mm -hmm. we're kind of hanging out in the rubble and mm -hmm. it's pokey and painful. And we get to move through it. We can bravely mm -hmm. face it and come come through on the other side yeah yeah it's such a good yeah also that james baldwin quote i put in there about it's something like if we can't face it we can't change it or name it mm -hmm. so we have to face it yeah mm -hmm. thank you so much for bringing your personal story into mm -hmm. that remembering of devastation and offering um, one path for for healing and I just it's so like it is just like making me tear up thinking about Moroccan Jews coming to New York City and not being able to practice or pray with other Jews and just like yeah it's so intense and um not our fault like no. <laughs> the price of the ticket right so mm -hmm. how the, the cost of whiteness, of mm -hmm. safety, we perceive safety. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we will assimilate to mm -hmm. stay alive. Mm -hmm. and, and then we lose each other. Yeah. It is so sad. And we lose ourselves. Yeah. 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 But we don't have to. No. And we can refine each other. And it's like, that's what I love so much about this podcast. And I'm, yeah, just feeling really emotional about it. So thank you for helping hold this space for that. There are so many kinds of Jews. And we like, you know, I was raised believing that there was a certain thing that meant Jewishness, you know, and so the more I get to like connect with other queer Jews and disabled Jews and Jews from all over the world who have celebrated and observed in all these different ways and be like, and we are a people, we are connected to each other. We get to like pray and love and grow together. Like that just is so significant. Yeah. And something I was saying to you and Rebecca earlier is that this planner was such an invitation uh, for so many of us that wondered, do I belong? Do I fit my type of Judaism? I mean, this project that the two of you have done was one of the first places where I really saw centered disabled Jews, queer Jews, indigenous Jews, Jews of color, Jews of the global majority. I remember when I, when you first sent me the invitation to sub, to put in a piece, I was like, what's your commitment to having Jews of color and indigenous Jews? And you were like, mm -hmm. oh, you had a whole thing about it. Mm -hmm. It was not about tokenizing. It was about mm -hmm. this is who we are. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much for this project mm -hmm. over the years to see myself. I belong. I can enter. And we have a thing. We have a mm -hmm. thing. We can mm -hmm. hold it in our hands. It's like, mm -hmm. I exist. I mean, we mm -hmm. are people of the book. 
but thank you I mean precious people <laughs> we're lucky to have you yeah I <laughs> feel lucky to know you and <laughs> to have you contribute your spirit and your voice to the planner and I think there's also this piece that I don't know how old you are exactly but around our age or a little older I feel like a bit of like us in this kind of in-between generation like between mm-hmm. like 40 and 55 or something around there or and for some people it's older too mm-hmm. um but like we were out, always been outside the margins and mm-hmm. outside of what was thought of as the Jewish center. I mean, I know for me, I didn't grow up with a lot of Judaism and mm-hmm. didn't feel Jewish enough, didn't learn Hebrew as a child. Like all of these mm-hmm. things felt just outside mm-hmm. in so many ways. And so coming back, Mm -hmm. carving my own path as an adult, I don't think I could have ever imagined a Judaism that didn't include everyone Mm -hmm. in my early 20s, because Mm -hmm. the people that I was meeting and making community with, who were also Jewish, were other people who didn't feel like they were Jewish enough, and other people who felt at the margins. Mm-hmm. And we we started this like queer havara here in Olympia in my early twenties, and I was that's like, how we met each other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was like, this is the only way to be Jewish for me. <laughs> like that set the standard 25 years ago or whenever that was you know um and just my whole life it's been a process of like meeting people over and over again who say I don't feel Jewish enough that I don't feel like I belong in Judaism or like my grandparents converted am I really Jewish like all the different stories mm-hmm. and that became a values base mm-hmm. for me of everything that I do needs mm-hmm. to include people. And if it isn't, I need to learn how to include those people. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so Jenna, do you feel like you have it in you to say the Oscar Waskow piece again? <laughs> yes. And it'll come out totally different. And the story that I've heard is that Arthur Waskow, so elder Jewish guy, he noticed something for our generation of Jews that we weren't coming together the way that his generation of radical or activist Jews were. Mm. And so he pulled a crew of Jews together. I think East Coast know me. Mm -hmm. I think that's where it started. Mm -hmm. And then it became a a juicy group. Yeah, and that's, I was say that I was a part of the GC group on the East Coast because I had just moved to Chicago. But we only met once um, and it kind of fell apart. But I know that the West Coast GC group was a lot stronger and had more longevity. Mm-hmm. Wow. I, th- I went three different years before we wow. decided to not do it again. And the Jews that I met are in my life today and Mm -hmm. have been part of big life transitions for me. Um, Mm -hmm. We call ourselves family. Uh, Mm -hmm. And it definitely, I was saying to Rebecca that it was one of the first times that I hung out with Jews of color as we are activist, radical Jews of color meeting Mm -hmm. with that intention like it was our mm-hmm. walk. We would always do a Jews of color walk in the mountains in California. And mm. how, I don't know what they call the mountains. I, as a New Yorker, a Midwesterner, I'm like, those are mountains. And they're like, actually, they're just hills. But anyway, <laughs> California hills. And what I know is that it gave us some ground to say we are Jewish. And this is mm-hmm. the way we can do Jewishness. I remember one ritual. We always did a welcome ritual circle. And you would do a check-in, and then we would sing the chorus of True Colors by Cindy Lauper to each other. Mm. And that was our that was our Jewish ritual. I love that. So did we get at that generational thing, Rebecca? That you yeah. Yeah. I mean, I really appreciate that there was an elder 
looking out for Mm -hmm. a bit younger people and making sure Mm -hmm. something got passed along. And, you know, I wasn't part of the juicy group and, and reflecting now, I think that one part of it, why I wasn't is because I wasn't out as disabled when I was that age, even Mm -hmm. though I was disabled. And I think that um, there was a way that it was a group like pulling in people from the margins, but I wasn't seen enough at the margins at that time. Mm. But it was interesting because it was lots of my friends and people were <laughs> a part <laughs> of it. And that that this project that we really, it's in many ways an extension of that time of our lives and some of that work as mm. well. And I mean, it's been amazing just in the few years that we've been doing this, that there's been so much growth in the Mm -hmm. Jewish community in this time in the world that Mm -hmm. there is becoming more and more inclusion and visibility for Jews of color, disabled Jews with a long way to go. But this, I mean, anti-Zionist Jews, anti-Zionist Jews, (laughs) right. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. One of um, thinking about how do we how do we identify? Can our people see us and say, mm-hmm. "Oh, you're we are coming from an anarchist mm-hmm. scene and riot girl." Mm-hmm. Um, we've had to do it. We've had to do it ourselves. And mm-hmm. how brave? How much more brave can we be together? Like yeah. seeing Nomi on stage in her glittery pork t-shirt like (laughs) oh that's what a jewish person can do that's Mm -hmm, what an anti-zionist queer disabled jewish person can do we can Mm -hmm. rock the stage yes well sign me up i was like Mm -hmm. okay well i have i i have a guitar and i like singing with other people let's do it Mm. (laughs) yeah and and riot girl gets to be jewish Yeah, that was the first place that I found Jews who I felt reflected by or was like, oh, we're actually like kindred spirit was at a Riot Girl convention meeting like Jewish punks from other parts of the country and being like, oh, wow, like that's a thing that isn't just this weird like subset of my reality that is connected to like my family and you know I there were so few Jews in my town growing up so Mm -hmm. it was a really big deal to be like oh my god there's other Jews that like punk music or like are anti-authoritarian you know and like Mm -hmm. yeah some of my early reclaiming of Jewishness was about turning the star of David into an anarchist symbol you know like the A like accentuating the A in it (laughs) Oh, Naomi, that's so cool. <laughs> yeah. Well, anarchists do that. Jews do that. Jewish anarchists do that. We like punk rock. <laughs> like singing together. Like yeah. um, you think with a tradition of nagoons and mm-hmm. uh, cleaning, grieving, that we mm-hmm. would we would say, oh, this thing is for me or for us. But mm-hmm. we, yeah, oppression is no joke, eh? It is yeah. just no joke. Yeah. Yeah. We went to go see this amazing performance last night, Nomi and I. This person, Aurora, or Aurora. <laughs> I don't know their last name. I don't either. I don't think they publicized it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. This person named Aurora who lives in Olympia and is a young queer, I anarchist. believe, anarchist Jew. Yeah. yeah. Who's like learned all these old Yiddish songs, partisan mm-hmm. songs. Mm-hmm. And Ladino, and, one of the songs and, they sang yeah. was Ladino. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And this person, Ariel, did like a light box puppet show to go along with it. It was incredible. It was incredible. It was amazing. Their voice, they were like channeling such this old world voice in a way that's very, like, I feel like I also channel a kind of old world voice, but it's a very different as like this kind of like higher, little bit warbly, just like sounded like the recordings of these old Yiddish songs. It was so beautiful. Mm -hmm. I mean, they felt like this person felt like, I felt this before when I've met and talked to them too, (laughs) like that they just stepped out of 
the old country. They're just, I mean, even how they dress, it's like kind yeah. of like. <laughs> it's their thing, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it's so cool to see that like younger generation also like finding and reinvigorating these old things that are still so relevant. Yeah. That's right. I'm inspired by how intrigued you are, Rebecca, with thinking about generations. And when you were with Aurora last night, did you think, oh, I'm an older generation hanging out with a younger mm. generation? How mm. am I going to cheer them on? I Yes, mm. I, I, I wow. think about all the time. Like, I feel like yeah. so much of my work is in reverence to younger people. And wow. because I think about what it was like for me in my 20s mm. and that I just felt mm. alone a lot and definitely as a child and teenager. So I am, I'm always thinking about the younger people of like how mm -hmm. to invite them in to mm -hmm. the work. Like that, that's, that's the majority of my work that it is in reverence to younger people. Mm -hmm. yeah. Also, I feel like I'm learning so much. I mean, there's like things that yes. younger generations have access to that are like that I haven't had access to yet or you know so it's like I see the way they're connected to each other and the way that they're practicing their Jewishness that is just like oh my gosh like I want to be a part of that I want to learn from them you know it's really yeah. cool yeah I um, learn stuff from them all the time like the mm -hmm. classes that I teach I'm like oh I am just as much a student here as a teacher mm -hmm, mm -hmm. for for the other people and like I mean this person last night speaks Yiddish fluently and there's like a whole crew of them here in Olympia mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. they just like hang out and speak Yiddish to each other <laughs> wow I didn't know that they were fluent wow yeah I didn't even know that was possible and it leads me to that question that you have about how are we bringing in the world to come building the world mm -hmm. to come and Thinking about Riot Girl, what's what's the ripple effect of Riot Girl? It's mm. probably the performance you saw last night. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. is the ripple effect of Riot Girl, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. it's a. Sometimes I get bummed that people don't know about Riot Girl, but mm -hmm. we see it all the ripple mm -hmm. effects all the time. It's so fantastic, mm -hmm. and to be seen. Whoa, so. <laughs> How to remember, and I know me, I think that's one of the things that I've learned from you is when did I see you in that show 30 years ago that mm -hmm. we get to sing and dance and have bodies, mm -hmm. however our bodies work, that's being Jewy. Yeah, <laughs> yes, yes, that embodiment, yeah, reveling in the physicality. Yeah, thank you for saying that and naming that. Oh, yeah. I'm just so damn grateful for the two of you. It's so great. This planner, all of the work that the two of you have done over the years and that you continue to do. And, oh, I I hope that mm. we all get to show you in big and little ways how all the ripple effects mm. of your love and care. Yeah. Mm. Thank, thank you. Again. Yeah. All I want is just a place to be you know like just having community having being in reciprocal relationship with people who's i'm so grateful to be in the world with and i can't wait to continue to collaborate with you and oh, witness okay. your work and yeah i'm like it's so amazing to have these relationships that are decades old that are just beginning you know mm, so beautiful <laughs> the tentacles the webs yes yes it, I know, I mean, everything it, in its own time. Yeah. Yeah. We mm -hmm. dreamed about having a dreaming the world to come retreat with all the contributors. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. That would be so amazing. We have to get funding. So someday. Wouldn't that be <laughs> have, amazing? We both have like beautiful land here and spaces. Oh. Like it would be like, so it's going to happen. It's going to happen. <laughs> Wait, I believe that. Yeah. I mean, Look at what the three of us have pulled off. And that's just mm -hmm. the three of us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you for reminding yeah. us of that, of like the big picture mm -hmm. of like 
how important one life is, even when you don't really think it is or can't have that mm-hmm. perspective a lot of times. Mm-hmm. I mean, this conversation with you feels so expansive. You're such a big mm-hmm. person. Like your spirit is so vast mm-hmm. that it feels like so, so much is happening in this moment. <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh my goodness. Well, I want to keep talking to you forever and we have another person to interview in two minutes. Mm-hmm. Um, (laughs) but um you're amazing i can't wait to talk more soon well i love both of you remember to stretch and look away from the screen yeah 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 Yeah. love right back to you jenna Milkweed meditation for the month of Av. Take a few breaths in, breathing in the hot summer air, the hot humid air, the green. This is a month of Many ups and downs in the Jewish calendar as we've explored grief and joy and that they are interconnected. We also recognize the story of Jewish diaspora in the month of Av with the destruction of the temple The Jews were forced into diaspora, and though a tragedy on many accounts, it led to our story of moving throughout the earth, just feeling our blood moving through our veins, our breath going in and out. This movement, like diaspora, is a sacred story of travel and sharing, of adaptation and innovation. And like the monarch butterflies who use milkweed as their food and are one of the main pollinators for this beautiful plant, The monarchs travel too and feel the way your breath moves. Your breath knows no borders. The butterfly flying through the air knows no borders. Breathe into this dream of the world to come, supported by milkweed and monarchs. gorgeous love affair of monarch and milkweed, of diaspora and transformation. The transformation monarch is keenly aware of from mush to flight from Tisha B'Av to Tu B'Av. We need the mush to fly. Our prayer is for the true love of earth to emerge and for all beings to be free to move and travel knowing they will be received with open arms. And now it's time for the segment that we call This Way to Alam Haba. And this is a part where we talk about things in the world that are giving us hope and helping us feel our way toward the things in the world that we want to amplify, that we want to continue, that we want to build our future upon. And we were thinking and talking about 
the orcas who right now, I mean, people have been posting all these videos of the orcas coming really close to the shore in the Puget Sound in the Salish Sea. And this is interesting behavior. You know, also we know about the orcas that are basically attacking rich people's yachts and, <laughs> and uh, you know, basically having a full-on revolt right now. Um, but there's there's hopefulness in that the orcas are returning. And we were talking about how something that really brought a lot of attention and in light of Tisha B'Av and these public communal grief rituals, there was a orca mother in 2017 here in the Salish Sea where we live whose baby died and her name was Talakwa, the, the mother, and she carried her dead baby on her nose for 17 days. And it was this like very public, uh, just like I feel it right now um a lot of people were really impacted by this and that brought a lot more attention to what was going on for the orcas and within that there's one story of a specific orca who's been separated from her pod and her mother for a very long time her name is skali chachtanat mm -hmm. and she is going to be returning home soon and rebecca i'm wondering if you'll share more specific information about her and her journey and her her return yeah, so the Lummi tribe, which is a couple hours north of here on the Salish Sea, um, they there's an organization called Sacred Sea. You can look at their website, sacredsea.org. And they've been working to bring Scully Choctana back home. She's been trapped in at SeaWorld in Florida for 53 years. She was first taken with six other of her siblings from the Salish Sea in 1970. And she's the living remaining worker. But she's coming. Of those six? Uh, yeah. One. Or seven total. Oh, yeah. Got it. Wow. And so she's coming home and her mother is still alive. Um, and she, they, they, she sings the same song that her mother sings and you may have know her from her like performance name as Lolita. And she's also known in activist circles as Tokite. Um, but this has been a huge work that people have undergone for years. And it's, it's just incredible that this is happening and that this healing is possible at this time, thanks to um, so many people all over the world who have done ceremony, and thanks to the Lummi Nation and those heading this work of reconnection. Yeah. And I just want to say that, um, well, one of the names for the for Skalichachtanat's mom is Ocean Sun. And her mother, whose name was Granny, I believe, lived to be like 100 years old. And their pods are matriarchal and are run by the grandmothers. And so the idea, like when I think like, oh, my God, they've been separated for 53 years, but they could still have some time together. Yeah. Um, yeah so I just like... Oh my God, it just feels like the vibration through my body when I think about these whales being able to be together again and recognize each other's song. That is just whew, really powerful healing. So yeah, thank yeah, you. You don't, you don't forget your mother after 53 yeah. years. And yeah, the, the tribes in this area, very much the orcas are regarded as relatives. Mm -hmm. And this this reconnection, which they're speaking to it as rematriation, and it's I just really like have been following and had the privilege of being a part of some of the ceremonies that have been done, and that people took a totem pole that they brought across the U.S. to Florida from here, and so much ceremony along the way, so many people, mm. and that people have been dedicating their lives to this and I, I just I feel very grateful mm. to them. Yeah. 
Well, may Skalachachtanat's journey be as easeful as possible. That sounds very intense to be transported in that way. And yeah. um, may she have as much comfort as possible and know in her heart that she's returning. And may this be, a, what's the word, Har harbinger? Harb the word where it's like, mm. and now more of this is gonna happen yes. <laughs> yeah yes. just like more more and more and more and more like i feel this as a uh a return that can act as a catalyst for more and more return oh man may it be so amen. thanks everyone for listening to the of edition of dreaming the world to come podcast and we'll see you next month for Elul, which will be our last podcast. And stay tuned for release announcements about the 5784 planner. Thanks so much and blessings on your journey through Av. Mwah. Mwah. How beautiful and delicious it is to see the way you move. I notice and perhaps you notice me noticing you. How beautiful and delicious it is to see the way you move. I notice and perhaps you notice me noticing you. The world is alive. We're in this together. Let's take it outside. And into forever, the world is alive. We're in this together, let's take it outside. And into forever, how beautiful and delicious it is to see the way you move. I notice and perhaps you notice me noticing you. How beautiful and delicious it is to see the way you move. I notice and perhaps you notice me noticing you. The world is alive. We're in this together. Let's take it outside. And into forever. The world is alive. We're in this together, let's take it outside and into forever, the world is alive.